My name is Dan Penny from the University of Sydney and I'm going to be with you for a short time today to talk a little bit about a place called Angkor in Cambodia, uh, which is an interesting place in itself with an interesting story, but I actually wanted to really talk to you about uh, some really fascinating research that goes on at the University of Sydney, uh, which is really changing the way we think about uh, history. Uh, so I am a, a geoscientist and what that means really is someone who is interested in studying the earth, uh, both its physical processes but also as a home for people. Uh, and so we're particularly interested in the interactions between humans and their uh, built and natural environments. Uh, so when we look at historical sites like Angkor from the view of a geoscientist, we are actually asking questions about how the city uh, sat within its landscape, what effects it had upon its landscape, and also what consequences things like climate change have for uh, settlements like this. So the first question we have to ask really is what is Angkor? Uh, and we have very different uh, and somewhat uh, curious ideas about this place. Many of you may be familiar with uh, the temples of Angkor from things like uh, Tomb Raider, some of the gentlemen in the audience may be surprised to learn that there were actually temples there and to prove that I've shown you a picture uh, with uh, the Angkorian temple of Taprom uh, behind Lara Croft there. Uh, many of the young women in the audience are hopefully rolling their eyes at this point. Suffice to say however that this uh, represents a view of Angkor which has been very common in the Western world, that is to say uh, a ruined metropolis, a city that's been consumed by the jungle that's really not uh, the whole story, as we'll see uh, in the next little while. Uh, Angkor, of course, is located in northwestern Cambodia, as you can see in that map, uh, which is part of the Indo-Chinese Peninsula. So it borders Thailand and Vietnam uh, and the Gulf of Thailand. Uh, and Angkor exists on a, uh, a very large uh, and flat alluvial plain within the middle of Cambodia. Uh, this is an image of, of Angkor Wat, which is probably the most famous of the Angkorian temples. It was built in the latter part of the uh, 12th century by a king called Suryavarman II. Uh, it is the world's largest freestanding religious monument uh, and certainly uh, one of the most extraordinary achievements of art and architecture anywhere in the world, it really is quite an extraordinary monument. It's also the best preserved uh, temple within uh, Angkor. Many people think of uh, Angkor as being synonymous with this particular temple, that is Angkor Wat, and many people say to me when I describe what I do, oh you work at Angkor Wat. That's not strictly true because Angkor Wat is only one uh, temple with, within the city and there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of temples. Uh, within this city. In fact, if you look at this image on the screen, essentially everything that you can see uh, from where you're standing to the horizon is part of that large, um, low-density city. Uh, only some of that remains visible, and um, places like Angkor Wat really reinforce that view we have of Angkor of being a lost metropolis that's been swallowed by the jungle and utterly abandoned by the people that built it. Here's another view of Angkor Wat, this time looking to the south and west, uh, and you can see the moat that surrounds the temple there. Angkor Wat is slightly unusual because it opens up to the west, uh, that is the direction of the setting sun of course, and it's always been thought to be, as a result of that, a mausoleum or a tomb uh, facing the direction of death. Uh, most other Angkorian temples of course open to the east, which is uh, the rising of the sun. Uh, and you can see to the south there, there's a large uh, city emerging. That is the town of the modern town of Siem Reap, which is the gateway to the World Heritage Park, uh, which covers about 400 square kilometres of Angkor. But again, you can see that there's an awful lot of forest there uh, that's grown back over this city after it was abandoned. And that again leads to that uh, impression that we have of Angkor of being abandoned, swallowed by the forest, uh, and it having collapsed at some stage in history.
What we know of Angkor, in fact, is, is very limited. Uh, and so we have something in the order of a thousand stone inscriptions written in Sanskrit and Old Khmer. Uh, and they tell us many things. The Sanskrit texts generally uh, are written to emphasize the importance and the grandeur of the king or of uh, noble families. And the Khmer, the Old Khmer texts, uh, are written uh, as really kind of administrative lists of things. So we have a, a reasonably large body of information from these written historical sources but they are very limited in terms of what they tell us about daily life and about the operation of the city and what pe how people lived and what they thought. Uh, we also have very very few historical accounts uh, from Angkor. In fact really there's only one uh, account by a Chinese uh, emissary from the Chinese court who visited in 1296 and stayed for a, a short while, uh, a chap named Zhao Taquan. And his account remains probably the definitive historical record of what life was like in Angkor, uh, really uh, at its peak. And, and so he says, uh, and I quote, at the center of the kingdom rises a golden tower flanked by more than 20 lesser towers and several hundred stone chambers. On the east side is a golden bridge guarded by lines of gold north of the uh, the Tower of Bronze, a truly astonishing spectacle, he says. And he goes on to say, these are the monuments which have caused merchants from overseas to speak so often of Cambodia, the rich and noble. Now, this is a, uh, an emissary from the Chinese court, so presumably he knows something about wealth and splendor. And clearly at this point, uh, the 1290s, uh, Angkor was a, a thriving, populous, very, very wealthy, um, a quite extraordinary place to be. And so it's this... Uh, view of Angkor that we have from the very, very limited historical sources that tell us uh, or, or set up this strange conundrum because uh, after this point, Angkor effectively uh, falls out of history. It goes black. It disappears from the historical record and we have nothing until uh, the um, 19th century, really. We have some earlier historical accounts from Portuguese visitors in the 16th century and so on, uh, but effectively uh, we don't really get a clear view of Angkor in the West until it was so-called rediscovered by early French naturalists and explorers um, uh, who were working their way through Indochina in that period of history. And so we have these wonderful lithographs uh, made in the 1860s uh, by French explorers who are recording these monuments uh, lost in the forest, abandoned, swallowed by the jungle. And here we see the South Gate of the walled city of Angkor Thom with its uh, faces uh, pointing in all cardinal directions. Uh, here is Angkor Wat uh, as it was then, still very well preserved and you'll notice on the left there a little modern uh, hut. Uh, this was always a monastery and was never truly abandoned. Uh, here we have the, the famous face towers of uh, the Bayon in the centre of Angkor Thom, quite an extraordinary monument. Uh, depicted here with a little bit of artistic flourish but nevertheless you get the impression of it being a very complex building and so this is the view we have of Angkor in the 1860s you can see that little uh, map square in there and effectively what we are looking at uh, in this square here is Angkor Tom uh, Angkor Wat is in here and effectively this is a, the river heading down towards the lake this is the Tonle Sap Lake a very large freshwater lake uh, and so this is what we knew of Angkor, this is what we understood of it, uh, and this is how we defined it. But of course that view changed as time went on, and continues to change in fact. This map produced during the Second World War uh, shows you the same landscape, but here we have Angkor Thom, the large walled uh, city, enclosed city. This is Angkor Wat, and again, you should reflect on the fact that this is the world's largest religious monument, and it looks tiny here. Uh, we also start to have these strange features appearing. These are uh, reservoirs called Barai in Khmer. Uh, enormous reservoirs. Uh, uh, this one is uh, two by six kilometers in uh, in area. It's a very large reservoir. So more and more detail emerging as uh, more exploration went on. And then we have this map in uh, the late 1970s produced by a French scholar um, uh, called Bernard Philippe Collier, uh, who was a, a very brilliant man and, and made a lot of uh, had a lot of thoughts about Angkor and made a lot of observations that proved uh, true following further work after the Khmer Rouge period. And so what he's starting to show here is not only Angkor Wat, uh, 
uh, and Angkor Tom and these big reservoirs. He's also starting to show these roads uh, and embankments and uh, rivers and canals and, and all these kind of small uh, dots scattered around, which he called the hydraulic suburbs. They were very small settlements where most he thought most people probably lived within this city. And so that was the picture uh, up to the point where uh, the, uh, the, the war in Indochina uh, and the civil war that followed in, in Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge period uh, really stopped work in Angkor. It wasn't until the early 90s that the French school of the Far East, the École Française d'Extreme Orient, was able to re-establish itself and begin uh, working again in this area. So if we skip forward a little bit to uh, 2006, 2007, this is what Angkor now looks like. This, is, this was published by uh, uh, Dr. Damien Evans, who's from the University of Sydney, and colleagues in 2007. And this is the comprehensive map of Angkor showing its true scale. And so what we see here uh, is a city that is not merely uh, Angkor Wat or Angkor Tom, uh, or indeed uh, these large reservoirs is in fact a low density city that's in the order of a thousand square kilometers in area which makes it the world's largest pre-industrial city a massive uh, low density settlement population uh, estimates at Angkor vary dramatically uh, but uh, a current working hypothesis is that at its peak there was around about three quarters of a million people living in this massive uh, city uh, so our view of what Angkor is has changed fundamentally from being uh, one temple that's been abandoned and lost to the forest to being uh, a succession of temples uh, again lost in the forest to being a whole pre-industrial low-density city that's actually the largest of its kind on the planet uh, and supporting a population that's approaching a million people. So it's a fundamental revolution in our understanding of this place. Uh, recent work uh, has taken this a little further. You can see here is a, a picture of a helicopter and the little white thing strapped to the side of it is called a LiDAR instrument. Uh, it looks a little bit like a, a luggage pod you'd stick on top of your car, but in fact what it's doing is shooting down millions upon millions of points uh, of lasers down at the ground uh, and the helicopter will fly a set path, uh, rather like mowing the lawn back and forth, back and forth. Uh, shooting those lasers down at the forest. And one of the problems we have at Angkor, of course, is because uh, there's so much forest, we can't really see what's on the ground. Uh, and so a lot of the archaeological and cultural features are obscured by this very dense tropical forest. The LIDAR allows us to do is to strip away that forest effectively by shooting these millions of points through the forest canopy, some of which will hit the ground and be recorded by the instrument. So it enables us to effectively look at what the ground surface is like below the canopy and this is the first time this has ever been able uh, to be achieved. It was led by again Dr Damien Evans from the University of Sydney in a consortium uh, who managed to get the money together to um, uh, ensure this went ahead and the results are really quite extraordinary. So I'll show some of those to you now. Uh, here we have uh, the uh, northeast uh, corner of Angkor Wat. So this is inside the enclosure, inside the moat. You can see the moat here which goes around it. Uh, and so here's the temple just poking its, uh, its cheek into the picture uh, and one of the, the main axes that enters into the, uh, the monument. So this is the northeastern corner and as you can see it's covered with forest and we can't really see anything below it. Uh, but if you were to use the LiDAR instrument you can effectively uh, strip that forest away and what it reveals you can see here on the left. This is obviously a false colour image so it's showing you differences in height and effectively what we can see is it causeway? But we can also see these little uh, 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 ponds, or basins, and these mounds, and you can also see this grid-like structure all through the city, and that continues right through uh, the enclosure of Angkor Wat, effectively revealing that this isn't a, a blank landscape. It's in fact a, a very intensively used landscape. It's very heavily occupied. It's gridded with roads or canals. It's got mounds where people would have had their houses, or there would have been other. Uh, presumably quite formal structures built upon them. So by no means an abandoned landscape and by no means a blank canvas. So if you look at the whole of Angkor uh, Wat uh, and you can see here uh, the moat, uh, the monument itself is here in the middle but it's been obscured in these data, you can't really see it very clearly. And here's that section we were just looking at in the northeastern corner. 
And what you can see is that pattern of occupation, the gridding, the ponds, the mounds, is extensive all the way through the enclosure of Angkor Wat, but it also continues outside. You can see it all the way around. Okay, there's occupation, very intensive occupation all the way around the monument, and it seems to be uh, the same kind of occupation, the same kind of settlement pattern. We also see very curious things like these um, uh, strange geometric patterns south of Angkor Wat, which we really have no explanation for, uh, and it's really rather embarrassing because this is the main uh, entrance into the World Heritage Park and, and literally millions of visitors come along this road every year uh, and don't notice uh, these features which are on either side of the road in the forest. And we've missed them for the better part of a decade. So uh, these new technologies which are being uh, uh, led by a consortium called the Khmer Archaeological LIDAR Consortium uh, and particularly by Dr Damien Evans from the University of Sydney are really, again, revising what we understand of this place uh, in terms of an archaeological landscape, but also in terms of a lived landscape, how people actually lived uh, in this place. And here's a, a little image that comes from uh, a, a guy called Tom Chandler, who's at Monash University. He and his team produced these really rather wonderful visualisations of Angkor as it would have looked in its heyday. This is Angkor Wat again, and this time we're looking, uh, I guess, north-northeast across the monument. Uh, and here's the, the northeastern corner we were just looking at in LIDAR, a gridded with structures on it, and you can see these kinds of uh, buildings uh, right around the monument. The towers would indeed have been gilded with gold, as we heard uh, from Chaltaquan earlier on in this presentation. So really a rather splendid uh, view. However, this isn't uh, the entirety of Angkor by any stretch of the imagination. If we pull back out to look at the whole of the settlement, uh, and then we focus back in on a particular area down here, uh, in the uh, southeast, we can see that there is a, a different kind of settlement pattern. And this is what, if you remember, Bernard Philippe Grolier called uh, the hydraulic suburbs. So these are where daily life would have gone on outside of the main monuments and outside that uh, quite dense inner core of Angkor. Uh, and so we have this uh, almost like a, a constellation of house mounds uh, and small excavated reservoirs called Chapiang uh, and small temples, the little flags on this map are showing uh, where the temples are located. So if we uh, go in even smaller in scale and have a look at this particular um, uh, site, uh, it looks a little bit like this on the ground, this is representative, representative of those kinds of features. So what we see here is a, this kind of curious horseshoe shaped uh, moat and a mound in the middle and on top of that would have been a temple like a equivalent I guess a, the equivalent of a, a village church in the west a small tower or prasat as it was called uh, which would have had a causeway across it uh, facing the east so we're looking west in this image and here we have one of those small excavated basins a trapiang which provides uh, water these are groundwater fed features, so they're not fed by rivers or streams, they're fed by groundwater, which is very high in this part of Cambodia. Uh, and around these, uh, these, these core features would have been houses built on small mounds, and these houses invariably are built of wood and thatch, uh, and of course they've disappeared from the archaeological record. What's left are these excavated features and brick and ceramic and stone, but everything else is gone. So if we have a little bit of a, uh, an imagination of what this might look like, here's another image produced by Tom Chandler and his team from Monash. And again, you can see this uh, horseshoe-shaped moat uh, facing to the east. So in this case, we're looking to the uh, south. And you can see the, um, the prasat here, which may have been built of brick. Uh, and off to the east, uh, the, uh, the trapiang, the excavated basin. And so what you can see around it are Lots of little houses, uh, lots of little farming families uh, which make up this community uh, living in amongst, in this case, lots and lots of these palm trees which are called barassus, which is a sugar palm, a very valuable uh, resource tree. So this may have been what Uncle looked like in the, say, 11th, 12th uh, centuries when it was at its peak. Uh, and what we find that this settlement pattern uh, goes on and on and on. It's very monotonous and it's very, very stable. Uh, all across the landscape at Angkor and it seems to be laid out across the landscape in such a way as to almost ignore the big state level infrastructure, the big reservoirs, the big temples, the big canals, uh, 
uh, seem to be in some way disconnected from uh, this low-level uh, local community uh, uh, type settlement that we see extensively all the way through Angkor. Okay, so the other thing we notice about this place is there is a lot of uh, what we might call linear infrastructure and by that I mean things like canals and you can see one in this image here. This is the North Canal, uh, an image taken from an ultralight plane which we've used extensively to map uh, and ground truth uh, a lot of uh, work we do in Angkor. This one is heading due north around about 15 kilometers uh, to the hills in the, which you can just see in the distance. Uh, and this canal uh, amongst others is bringing water south from natural rivers into the center of Angkor. Uh, part of a system of infrastructure which was built to manage uh, and to control the flow of water uh, through Angkor. And in part these canals were used to supply and feed those massive reservoirs uh, in the centre of Angkor, the use of which is still uh, highly contested amongst scholars of this place. So there were many of these types of canals. This one is partially full now, but still carrying, full of sediment I mean, uh, but partially carrying water in the wet season. We also have things like this. This is a, one of the royal roads that radiates out from Angkor uh, to the provinces uh, and you'll see on the right hand side of the road which is the northern side the upstream side uh, effectively a canal uh, so these things have had a dual function they're moving water from one place to another but also creating a road above the wet season floods above the rice fields that allowed the passage of uh, traffic uh, between Angkor and its provincial cities so if we look at uh, Angkor's network if you like, if you want to think about it that way. Here we have Angkor uh, smack dab in the middle of Cambodia. Here's the Tonlesap Lake, that enormous freshwater lake. Uh, and here's the Mekong River running south to the South China Sea. What we find are these massive royal roads which extend up into modern day Thailand, up into modern day Laos, uh, and uh, right down through uh, modern Cambodia. In fact, these uh, roads connect uh, major settlements like Pere Khan, uh, like Pu, Sambal, Pre, Cook, um, and up to Pi Mai in Thailand, but they are only representative of the formal part of the network uh, that makes up Angkor's kingdom. Angkor, in fact, at its height, subsumed most of mainland Southeast Asia from northern Thailand right down to the South China Sea. It was a massive kingdom, uh, and Angkor was the capital city within that kingdom, uh, supplied and serviced by a range of satellite cities, uh, which were also very impressive and very important and in fact about which we know very little more and more is being discovered about those satellite cities every day. So again, it, it challenges us to rethink what we know about this place, starting from an individual temple that's been abandoned and lost somehow into the forest, uh, to an understanding of that place being part of a city which is part of a much larger network subsuming most of mainland Southeast Asia. So why did uh, Angkor collapse, I guess, is the pervasive question and one that everyone asks, how is it that this place uh, became abandoned at some point in uh, after the 15th century? When the answer that I would give you is that it didn't collapse. In fact, the word collapse is not appropriate in this case. Uh, the city was not destroyed, the city did not fall over, the people that lived there didn't all die, nor did they all migrate en masse somewhere else. Uh, Angkor's king, uh, his court, uh, the administration that supported it, uh, many of the elite families certainly did leave uh, and relocated uh, close to the modern capital of uh, Phnom Penh. Uh, but there was a residual population that was left there uh, sometime after that. Uh, it, this was not a collapse, this was rather a transformation and it was representative of a series of transformations that occurred in Khmer history where the capital moved from one place to another. So this isn't in any way uh, an example of the collapse of a society at all. And this isn't a place which was entirely abandoned to the jungle as a result of some catastrophe. It was a, it was a, a transformation in Khmer society and the movement of a capital uh, representing something that had been going on for many years. So uh, there's been a lot of speculation about why the king, the court, the administration and the elite and many of the population eventually moved. And it's been put down to things like the invasion of the Thai army out of Ayutthaya, the uh, then capital of uh, Siam, uh, in 1431. The historical evidence for that is very uh, uncertain. 
Uh, there have been a range of hypotheses ranging from epidemic disease uh, through to some form of geological uplift through to uh, a change in the religious structure um, and a pervasive argument is that perhaps um, maritime trade was becoming so uh, um, so attractive to uh, the mercantile classes at Angkor that the city was moved because of that uh, the lure of that maritime trade closer to the Mekong Delta uh, and the South China Sea. There have also been arguments that there was such a prodigious amount of building at Angkor that the effectively the economy and the people were exhausted. Um, uh, uh, but uh, there is really no basis to make any um, uh, decisive argument on any of these hypotheses. We really don't have the historical information, the written texts, uh, uh, the, the historical accounts, or indeed the archaeological information to be decisive about any of these things. And so we have to use different techniques. One argument that was put forward by um, uh, French scholars uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s was that the demise of Angkor, its, its eventual transformation uh, and abandonment was somehow related to this hydraulic infrastructure that we see, these canals, uh, roads, uh, reservoirs. And that argument was simply that uh, this very, very complicated network of infrastructure to manage water uh, somehow ceased to operate properly. And that essentially meant that uh, the movement of water through the capital city was not well controlled, it was not provided to those places that need it, and was potentially doing a lot of damage uh, to other forms of infrastructure. And we can see a lot of that still in the archaeological record. Uh, but it's very difficult to test those hypotheses because we weren't around to observe it, and the historical information is lacking, as I've said, and there isn't a lot of archaeological information that can allow us to test uh, this, hypoth this hypothesis in, in particular. So how do we answer that question? And one of the ways that I've been doing that as a geoscientist is to turn to what we might call proxy environmental indicators. That is to say, uh, things that are preserved in the environment which uh, record the environment as it's changing over time. And that can be things like algae or insect remains or beetle remains or pollen from flowering plants uh, and conifers or spores from ferns um, opal bodies uh, called phytoliths or starch grains and so on and so forth and all of these things tell us something about the environment and how it's changing over time and it gives us potentially a view on Angkor and its changing environmental circumstances uh, which may allow us to test these hypotheses. Um, so you can see there uh, where I spend most of my time, this is a, the microscope I use and uh, I look down it to see things like this, this is a, a diatom, a type of algae. What can I tell about this? I can tell what kind of species it is and from that I can tell what kind of water chemistry it requires to live. So if I find these things as fossils I know uh, that the, at the time it lived and died those water chemistry conditions were apparent. So these things are abundant in the environment, there's lots and lots of them. Uh, they have hard parts, in this case a silica shell, uh, that are preserved over long periods of time, potentially tens to hundreds of millions of years. Um, can these things must be able to be identified in some way and they must have some environmental control that we can infer from their presence or absence. Uh, so how do we do that at Angkor? Uh, here's a, a plant, this is Barassus, I've already spoken to you about that in one of those uh, reconstructions that we saw, a very important economic plant. Barassus produces pollen, it's a flowering plant, a palm, uh, and it looks like this. This is a micrograph of a Barassus pollen grain uh, taken from a modern specimen. That pollen is released into the environment, moves around the environment, and is eventually uh, preserved in uh, depositional basins uh, like uh, Trapiang or Barai, these big reservoirs, or like the moats of the temples themselves. They'll uh, end up in the, in the water, they'll sink to the bottom of the water and be deposited in the sediment that accumulates in the bottom of these moats and uh, reservoirs. So I come along with my equipment and take a sample of that mud, a drill core that goes back through time, a horizontal section uh, that look rather like that. Uh, and I slice those up horizontally to uh, produce samples which represent uh, change over time or with depth. And I, from those sediment samples, I extract the pollen. And here's a fossil example of what a Barassus pollen grain looks like. Uh, so I'm able to uh, go back through time and count the number of these fossils I see to produce graphs like this. Uh, and here you can see uh, depth, which is also equivalent to age, effectively. Uh, 
uh, and a, in this case a percentage value. So what we see here is that as a percentage this particular taxon is increasing in importance over time and then is declining. And from that we can interpret various things and I'll show you an example of that now. Here's a, here's a, uh, a scanning electron microscope image of a pollen grain for those of you who are interested We've had very high pollen counts in Sydney at the moment uh, and lots of people are suffering from hay fever and it's largely because of things like this. This is a, a grass pollen grain from, this, from the genus Poa and the species Annua. Uh, and so you can see that uh, it's quite a, 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 a spherical, a bit like a planet. And it's got this little spot on it which is called a pore, which is where the pollen does its functional business of fertilising. Um, other pollen grains look uh, rather more dramatic. This is from the flower hibiscus. Uh, which is a lovely flower but produces pollen grains that look a bit like a medieval mace and you can see here uh, these very large spikes which enable it to stick to pollinating insects uh, and get between flowers. So these things end up in, um, in sediment sometimes and we can pull them out, look at them, identify them uh, and count them to see how they vary over time. Now I want to take you to a specific example at Encore where we've been deploying this technique uh, with some success and it's right in the middle of that very big reservoir there which is called the West Borai and remember this is 16 square kilometers in area it's massive and what we're seeing here from this helicopter shot uh, looking effectively north uh, this large area here is the reservoir this is in 2004 a very big drought and the reservoir was uh, almost completely dry uh, now this little square in the middle is a temple uh, it's called the West Mebon it sits right in the middle of the reservoir and it has a, inside it an excavated basin which is this green patch in here. There's lots of sw floating swamp on it now. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was try and take a sediment core out of that basin to see if we could understand how uh, the water supply to this massive reservoir changed over time. Here's a little uh, plan view of that enclosure. There's a sandstone wall here with steps going down into the basin. Here's where I took my core. There's also this long causeway that comes out to the middle and on this platform was uh, a reclining Vishnu, a, a Hindu deity that was entirely made of bronze, the largest bronze statue in Asia and an extraordinary piece of art. The remnants of it you can see in the museum in Phnom Penh, it's quite an extraordinary thing about the size of a, a sedan, massive reclining bronze statue which was smashed and buried ritually in the middle of that platform. Quite an extraordinary story and nobody really knows why. In any event, uh, we turned up here, you are standing on uh, the causeway looking uh, due east uh, at the entrance Gopura, some steps coming down uh, and on either side of this causeway is floating vegetation so it's floating on top of water. Uh, here's some of the, the carvings uh, on, the, on that entrance uh, pavilion. You can see very beautifully decorated uh, sandstone which has unfortunately been quite extensively looted but the style is very characteristic of the, the Bapuan period. So what we were looking for here is to try and understand uh, how the reservoir changed over time. So in this instance we have a full reservoir and a full Mebon. So here's the, the West Borai. There's its uh, northern dike, there's its southern dike, and here are the two walls of the West Mebon. So when the reservoir is full, so is the Mebon, because the water percolates through the wall. And when you have a full mebon, you have plants growing in it, which are a particular kind, and these kinds of things. Uh, plants which grow on the bed of the reservoir uh, and which require uh, standing water. If you were to see this uh, reservoir and in its uh, full bloom, it might look something like this. So you have uh, the reservoir full uh, and equally you have the mebon full. And you can see in this little reconstruction by David Hobson, uh, the reclining Vishnu sitting in the middle with the water fountaining out its navel, which is what it was designed to do. They're quite a splendid site and quite um, ritually important. Uh, however, if the reservoir is dry, uh, so too will the Mabon be dry and you will get different kinds of plants growing on the site and set, uh, putting their pollen into the sediment. So the hypothesis is that we can take a, a section of sediment from here and be able to look at changes in the kind of water plants or dry land plants that we see over time and thereby understand how water was uh, changing within the capital of Angkor over time. Uh, so it might have looked like this when it was dry for example. So here's me and my team taking a sample uh, on a floating platform uh, in the middle of the swamp. Not the most exciting thing in the world, many of you may think, but it's the kind of thing that I enjoy. And here's some results, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but 
Here, are, here is a time scale going back uh, into the 1100s. And this little purple patch here shows high abundance of freshwater algae, uh, which enjoy uh, standing water, and also aquatic plants which need uh, clear standing water to exist. So we know uh, that between the 1100s and the 1200s there was deep, clear standing water in the Mibon and therefore the reservoir was full. However, if we go forward in time we can see um, the appearance of uh, ferns and, and uh, herbs and other plants which require uh, relatively drier conditions and that occurs uh, really from the end of the 12th, the start of the 13th century. This strongly suggests that you've got uh, a, a reservoir which is really effectively dry or seasonally dry from the 13th century onwards, a large piece of infrastructure which is no longer receiving enough water uh, to function in the way it was designed. Now a large, uh, a large important suggestion is that this is uh, related to, to climate change and here's a, a climate record from the region, this one's from actually from India, uh, showing you um, over time from 600 AD to about 1550 AD uh, change in uh, monsoon rainfall from wet and dry. I won't worry about this axis, it's rather complicated and I don't want to distract you with it yet. But effectively we have a series of a wet years in green and very dry years in brown. These purple stars represent famines in India, so this is how uh, effective the droughts of the monsoon can be on human communities. And this big purple bar is when we think the West Melbourne was effectively or the West Barai was effectively abandoned as a piece of infrastructure for holding water. So what we see is that as you move into uh, the 13th and 14th centuries, there's a progressive decline in climate to around about 1350, 1360, when there's a very, very uh, strong drought which lasted for many decades. And you can see it here in this little blown up uh, part of the graph. After that, we have a, a, an improving climate up to around about normal to actually some quite wet years, but another long period of drought in the early part of the 15th century. And it's been suggested that uh, not only were these droughts very important in determining the fate of Angkor, that is to say, uh, supporting its agricultural productivity, uh, but it plays into the decisions that were made in uh, abandoning this really big hydraulic infrastructure, which we, which we would argue seem to have been abandoned uh, in, at the start of the 13th century when climates were relatively favourable uh, but, but then were urgently needed when the climate became very dry. So uh, let's just sum up. What did kill Angkor? Um, well, climate change certainly played a role, though it's by no means uh, a decisive uh, reason or the only reason for uh, the abandonment of the city. Uh, but it certainly did play a role. We think there's something uh, some interplay between climate change and the way that the very large-scale water management infrastructure operated, these large reservoirs, the canals that fed them, um, uh, and some kind of correspondence between the way these uh, two processes unfolded that resulted in such a problematic outcome uh, for Angkor and led to its eventual uh, abandonment, abandonment by the king, the court, the administration and the elite. So our working hypothesis at, the, uh, hypothesis at this point is that uh, a combination of climate change and the collapse of the water management system uh, led to conditions which were probably un unstable and unsuitable for large scale and intensive agriculture. And this may have er eroded the economic base and certainly the power base of the kingdom was already overstretched. Are we certain about that? No, of course not, but we're uh, working on it. Uh, our group at the University of Sydney have been working on this for over a decade now. Uh, and we have been um, recruiting uh, postdoctoral scholars postgraduate students, undergraduate students and volunteers for many years. Uh, and, and so this is a, an active field of inquiry uh, and uh, one which uh, all of you can become involved with at various levels, whether you uh, go on to university research or not. Um, I would encourage you to go and have a look at our website where you can see some of the diverse range of research uh, we're doing. Uh, and I encourage you also to, to contact me directly if you have any questions. I think this is a very exciting field of research uh, one which has a, a large number of applications and one in which everybody can become involved with as they move through their high school and university careers. Thanks very much. The chemical records of climate variability um, and so they're, they're very very robust
and in fact this is only this is this is one record but there are uh, now uh, perhaps half a dozen from the region which show the same pattern um, so we can be very confident from a range of different uh, sources of evidence uh, that these you know, very prolonged droughts, and we're talking droughts that lasted for decades, uh, were a, a real feature that occurred in, in Asia during uh, the latter part of the last millennium, the previous millennium. Uh, and they're somehow related, we think, to um, the El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycles, but it's a very uncertain um, it's very uncertain as to what's actually causing these things. It does, of course, behove us to reflect on what a, a drought uh, that lasts perhaps 30 years would mean for modern Asia. We're looking at that now, and we're looking at it by undertaking various archaeological excavations of uh, the places where people live their daily lives to see precisely when they did leave. Uh, so that's an emerging field of inquiry. However, I would say that there's plenty of evidence for occupation that goes uh, well into the what we call the post anchorean period, particularly things like imported Chinese ceramics within the context of domestic archaeological deposits. So we've actually got quite good evidence that daily life was going on for a number of, uh, for a long period of time after Angkor supposedly collapsed. So the argument has been, I think, that this isn't a, uh, this isn't a collapse driven by um, the uh, abandonment of agricultural lands by local communities. It's, a, it's, a, it's an abandonment driven by the core leaving first. So it, it's, re it's representative of the Khmer um, king uh, and the elite that supported his administration moved to the new capital. And th again, this is something that they've done many times in the past. So there's nothing revolutionary about this. They simply upped stumps and moved to the area around Phnom Penh. Uh, and so that leaves uh, a city without a, uh, notionally, uh, without an administrative head or a royal head. It leaves a city without the kind of administrative framework that allows the taxation system to run. I should say that this is a uh, this is a non-monetized society. They had no money. They were uh, uh, they were basically uh, um, uh, uh, producing goods and donating those goods to the temples as sort of a taxation system. Um, so, I think one of the things that was suggested very early by the French is that uh, the local people actually just persisted because they lived in small communities that weren't really tied to uh, the state level infrastructure. Um, that were quite resilient environmentally because they were using groundwater rather than surface waters, which is really the problem that we're seeing in these big reservoirs. And so they were able to persist for a long period of time. At some point, perhaps the attraction of a, of a new city with uh, the wealth and, and dynamism you get from the mercantile classes and the elite classes would have drawn people to uh, the area around Phnom Penh. But there's no reason why we should assume that uh, these very stable, monotonous settlement patterns we see around Angkor would have been um, threatened by uh, the movement of the administration or the, or the king. Quite possibly, these, are, these were discovered late last year in, the, in this image, effectively. Uh, so we really have no idea what they are. That's as plausible an explanation as any. Uh, the uh, somewhat humorous working suggestion is that these were um, raised garden beds, but uh, you would need to be growing potatoes the size of Volkswagens in order to justify this kind of infrastructure. Um, that's clearly not the case, but that's what we're calling them the gardens, just because it's a convenient title. Um, yeah, that's an entirely plausible explanation. I think the uh, Damien Evans and... Yeah, well, well, this is a, it's a, um, it's a, a lot of these monuments are um, uh, Vedic, that is to say, they're kind of Hindu, but there was also a lot of uh, several iconoclasms where the state religion shifted from uh, Vishnu to Buddhist and back again. Uh, so, yeah, this is in, it's entirely possible that this might be, a, as you say, a, a piece of Buddhist spiritual architecture. Maybe, I don't know. There's certainly no doesn't appear to be any cultural material, ceramics or brick or stone uh, on, the, on the mounds themselves, on these uh, raised features themselves. So their explanation is 
curious and we look forward to seeing what uh, Damien Evans and his consortium come up with. That's a good place to start. Alternatively, you can contact me directly about that. Um, with the University of Sydney has a, a permanent research base uh, in Siem Reap, the town of Siem Reap, which is just south of the World Heritage Site. Uh, and we maintain, uh, we have a whole series of uh, people uh, living in Cambodia, staff, University of Sydney staff living in Cambodia, um, uh, that can support that kind of thing. So uh, we're uh, yeah, always happy to hear from people. No, um, we don't, that, and that's in part because we don't have uh, any credible information about uh, the movement of populations out of Angkor itself or out of the cities that surround it within its kingdom. Um, we know we know when these um, when these cities of Udong, uh, for example, appeared in the vicinity of Phnom Penh, uh, and we have uh, good historical records from from that time. But we have no understanding of the way in which the uh, inland kingdom of Angkor became what, what we call the middle period uh, uh, cities of uh, effectively modern Asia. Uh, we really don't know how that process worked. And in fact, we're uh, exploring that now by looking at uh, evidence of human populations from these sediment cores I was talking about. Um, and in fact, I have a PhD student who's looking at uh, using records of the effect people have on the landscape, like burning, for example, which leaves a trace in the fossil record, but also things called fecal sterols, which are in fact produced in the gut of humans uh, and uh, which are um, uh, preserved in, in the landscape uh, and as, as a kind of pollutant, I guess. Uh, and you can... Uh, go back through the historical record or the sedimentary record, I should say, and analyse these uh, these particular things to see what the population was like. Uh, and it may not give us a, the ability to say that there were this many thousand people here in the 10th century and only this many thousand uh, in the 13th, but it'll certainly give us the ability to trace uh, patterns of population movement from Angkor and from the, from the satellite cities over time, which may actually give us an answer to that question. At this stage, we don't know. Uh, it's an open field, uh, and because um, work in Cambodia uh, on, in these, on these issues is relatively recent, and because the sites are so massive, uh, and there are so many of them, uh, the process of, of acquiring that knowledge is, is very difficult and very slow. Uh, and so, you know, you could, there are more questions. Um, we find more questions, I guess, than we find answers to them. <laughs> Thought to be related to the uh, the setting sun, which is symbolic of death. Uh, so Angkor Wat is a, uh, a Vishnite uh, monument, uh, and so here we're looking at the the temple uh, from the um, the northwest. So we're looking. This is the western entrance, effectively, uh, and the the monument is set out so that you approach it from the west. Uh, and so it's I think probably one of only a few. Um, monuments, perhaps the only one, I'm not quite sure, that actually faces in this direction. And it was uh, described even by Chao Ta Kuan when he visited in 1296 as a, as a tomb. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether there's been any historical or archaeological evidence to support that interpretation, but nevertheless, uh, that's its layout and that's the interpretation that's been ascribed to it. Again, uh, we have no um, plan or account that tells us that that was what they intended. It's merely what we can divine from what's left of it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.